Thank you, Jim. Thank you both speakers for those uh, wide-ranging presentations. So we now have uh, roughly uh, an hour to have some questions uh, submitted both by Slido and um, a debate from the, from the floor. So um, on that note, just can I just let the IT people know that I'm just seeing the full list of questions here now. I'm not seeing what's displayed on the screen, so I don't know if you're able to mimic that for me. Otherwise, I'll end up turning around. <laughs> but um, if we start off with uh, that top question there, uh, how important is it for vets to speak publicly about moving towards systems that don't use tail docking or beak trimming? So if we can get our speakers to maybe comment on that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's uh, the, uh, on, on, the f on the first point is, you know, the, what does society think vets are for? And vets are advocates for animals, I think is what society thinks they are. So uh, if that requires speaking uh, uncomfortable truths to their client base, that's what uh, the veterinary community needs to do. But at the same hand, of course, it, the veterinary community can help the uh, industry uh, move in that direction and uh, help with the, with the evidence base for that. So yes. Is, it is important that we, we, we do that and we speak honestly and we speak the truth, yeah. Jim, do you have? I, I agree, it's massively important for veterinarians to speak out on these issues. Uh, that's what we are supposed to do. Society looks to licensed people to, to uh, take care of that part of society for, for them or for us. And when we don't speak out for the animals in these cases, then it's a problem. And it's particularly a problem in, in North America, um, veterinary groups, uh, refuse to uh, accept criticism from any of any kind. So, so uh, we'll find that um, even though there's a consensus to, to not do tail docking or beak trimming um, in pigs and chickens, uh, we've, we just can't get a veterinary group to uh, make that public. And it would help a lot because the legislative bodies uh, wait until uh, they, they follow the veterinary, veterinary groups. If the veterinary groups in a state uh, don't uh, speak out and, and have a consensus on these issues, then the legislative body cannot ha have a consensus on it either. So, so it's, it's important. So I get the sense you both think we should, but maybe we don't speak out We should, but we don't. At least, at least most, most veterinarians around the world, I think that happens more here from what I, can, what I follow and read in the welfare world. Okay, looks like we probably have some comments from the floor. So... Where am I? There we go. Lady over there. Uh, I chair the Pig Health and Welfare Council. Um, I'd just like to say that we have got a voice out there. Um, we have a 2020 vision, and that had looking at tail biting. We're writing the 2031 now, and that has a definite we will not be having tail uh, trimming by the time we get to 2030. But welfare is getting the balance between the two. So we don't want to ban it and find that we've got a massive welfare problem because we still have tail biting. So it's finding the answer to that produces the answer to the other. But we are a very big voice for making sure that it is eliminated. Okay. Thank you. We've got a comment on the picture. Hello. Is that working? Yeah. Uh, John Fishwick here from BVA. Um, the comment I would make on that is I think veterinarians have a very important role in explaining why some of these procedures take place. Nobody docks tails or trims beaks because they're sadists. There's very good reasons for that, for, which have built up over many years. And I think explaining that and explaining the difficulties of just eliminating them overnight is a very, very important role we can um, play in informing the debate for the general public. Thank you. Kat McLaughlin from the National Farmers Union. Um, I'd, I'd like to thank both speakers for their, for their really informative talks. You're both on my Christmas card list. Thank you very much. Um, the one thing that I would say that I think the vets absolutely have a role in getting the science message out there about welfare. We have massive tensions in the UK around how we're going to produce food to go into the future, how we can maintain sustainable businesses, things like, you know, kind of your slides on kind of scale. In the UK, one of the problems we have is just actually getting planning applications through because there's such a dearth of, of truth, evidence, and science around welfare. So we end up having to kind of go along with the, the kind of the emotional arguments rather than the scientific one. And I think, to be honest, that's where I would welcome a lot louder veterinary voice um, coming from the industry myself, because I think, you know, kind of 
you can actually put the scientific arguments in, which will then hopefully avoid some of the precautionary principles being introduced into it and, that, and some of the emotional arguments. So vitally important, please. Okay, thank you. I think there's a comment there. Adele next and then. Hello, I'm Adele Waters from Vet Record. And Professor Reynolds, you spoke a lot about good practice in the US and you also talked about some states being more progressive in their welfare regulations. Could you talk about some of the states that aren't so progressive and some, perhaps some examples of some poor welfare standards that you've come across? Uh, the, the question is about states in the US that, that are not progressive in animal welfare, I think. Um, that's probably a lot easier than finding the ones that are progressive, but uh, a, 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 an example that, that might be uh, informative for this discussion is, uh, in, again, in California, where we're from, um, we passed an initiative, a ballot initiative or a re referendum where, where the voting part of the 40 million Californians uh, can vote. And, and we, in, in 2008, uh, the voters of California prohibited gestation stalls and battery cages and veal crates. Um, and, and that was one of the first times in, in the country that somebody had done that. Uh, now it had no teeth because we don't actually have pork in, in California. That comes from Iowa and other states. I, we have, we have 300,000 sows. Iowa has 16 million sows. Um, so it's easier to, to politically. But what it does is it drives the national uh, discussion and it drives, it because we are the largest market in, in the United States, uh, it drives the retailers in their programs. So, and then, and then, so, so <clears throat> those of us who were supportive of that re referendum uh, found that it actually, we thought it applied to product coming into California, but because we're a, uh, you know, a, uh, an, uh, an interesting country of states, but federal stuff too, um, it didn't. So we just passed last year, last fall, a referendum, and, and they're both passed by two thirds margins. Uh, so in any, anywhere in the, in the United States where we see this go to a referendum in a, in a, in a state, any of these welfare issues, it's always a two-thirds for and one-third against referendum to, to support animal welfare. But this time uh, we passed a referendum to uh, require product coming into California from anywhere to meet that standard. And now that's about to go to court and be challenged because the lesser states, Iowa, um, uh, don't want to, to do that. And, and so it seems... Uh, so, so we're in the process of doing that. Uh, another one, just quickly, is, is um, what are called ag-gag laws, or um, most of our uh, push for farm animal welfare improvements come from uh, undercover videos from animal advocates. There was just one released yesterday from a Midwest dairy. They continuously be released uh, over time, uh, people mistreating animals, uh, cows, calves. Uh, and, and so that spurs some movement in that state or region or certainly by the retailers to improve the programs and improve the uh, auditing or the confidence in the programs. And, 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 but some states, to, to directly to your, answer your question, some states have passed laws to prohibit people taking pictures on their farms. So instead of actually addressing the problems, I mean, most of us would say, thank you for presenting that information. I don't want that to happen to my animals. We'll go fix that. The states where the animals are actually produced, the Midwestern states, uh, have passed laws that are called ag-gag laws so that, so that a person can't um, misrepresent themselves to get hired to do this, and they cannot take videos or pictures. If they do, it's a criminal offense. And so, so that's, those are examples. There's more. <laughs> Hopefully that's sufficient examples to get you started to tell. Right, down at the front here. Um, hello, thank you very much for your speeches. Um, I just want to comment or just want to ask because we talked about how the veterinary community and veterinary voice is necessary for this movement for like better welfare. I was wondering what you think about incorporating this movement and like this, these considerations into veterinary education for like vet students from like when they're like learning about the animals and like the conditions and everything, the diseases, how can it be like incorporated to like make these students think about these questions before they even enter the veterinary field? But yeah, thank you. Thank you. Do you have any comments on that? I mean, so I have been involved in that when I was at the Bristol Vet School. You know, we, 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 we did bring about a change in what uh, was taught to the vet students and that has happened in, in the other vet schools too. But I, 
I, I want to go back to more recent graduates and think, so do you think there's a problem? Do you think it's not, not enough cover? And, what, and in what areas? What do you think should be more? Sorry, that was a bit unfair. But... You've lost your microphone <laughs> there at the front, so maybe that's a conversation for over lunch. Well, uh, but yes, well, have any, anybody else... Does anyone any, else have uh, an opinion uh, on has, that? ...has any thoughts? Because I think it, uh, I would just want to put it on the table as yeah, the, the Animal Welfare Found, uh, Foundation has done great stuff on that and has funded it. Uh, and uh, it's important to hear whether that has had the right effect. Is my question. Have a comment there. Um, hi, Hannah Fitzsimmons from the Association of Veterinary Students. Um, just a second, that students are actually quite proactive in sort of welfare discussions anywhere at university so it is being integrated into our teaching more um, especially at university of bristol um, but there are societies at our universities that will hold lectures outside so like get its external speakers in and have debates as well so we are sort of progressing in the right direction in our teaching for welfare as well okay thank you do you have any comments from the u.s perspective there jim on how integrated it is in the curriculum um it's not integrated in the curriculum in the u.s at all um we have rare animal welfare courses. They tend to be uh, a lecture or two here and there. We don't have, uh, very few schools have actual courses. Uh, where I work, we, we, uh, at Western University, we have problem-based learning, and, and we do have a vet issues course students take for the first two years. So they, they're exposed to advocacy and things like that. Um, the problem for, for, for us in the US is our veterinary students tend to have very high loans when they come out of veterinary school, they're between $150,000 and $300,000 in debt. And that's pretty serious. And so they tend to go straight into practice and make money, put their heads down and make money. Um, I think they'll come out later uh, and, and a bit more advocates than, than my generation was. They're more in, in, interested in it. Okay, thank you. Um, comments at the back there. Uh, Gudrun Ravitz, some health professionals and past president of BVA. Um, thank you very much and very interesting. Well, um, uh, some of the examples, particularly in China, showed uh, with no sickness in the calves, and we showed how we can fulfill physical health, and yet well-being is more than just physical health, um, and so we need to include mental well-being. How do we get the balance of those, and is it um, acceptable to have lower physical health to actually improve mental well-being and welfare across the board? And if we can't balance those, and we can't meet the other aspects of welfare, such as mental well-being, um, while maintaining such high physical health, should we actually be um, doing that procedure in the first place or encouraging that kind of system? Okay, Jim, do you want to go first with that? If, if I understood the question correctly, because <clears throat> um, my uh, dialect is a little different, sir. So, um, um, yes, and I'm glad you picked up on it. I, I kind of purposefully left in the, the morbidity rate, mortality rate as a, as a measure of animal welfare. And, and that grates on my nerves. I don't like that as a measure. I don't like production as a measure of animal welfare. But that's, that's where we tend to do it in North America uh, because that uh, satisfies profit and, and the, the regulations at the same time. Um, again, like I said, uh, what, we'll, what we're seeing, there, there's, it, it is true as uh, was stated in Dr. Main's um, uh, presentation. In a commodity, when, when, a, when, a, when a food product becomes a commodity, it, it can become a race to the bottom. And what happens is the, the retailers want a supply chain. And the, the simplest way to, to fill their supply chain is with really large farms. And so we're seeing, like I said, I put up the example, we're seeing group housing on really large farms that's working really well. And so if you're, if, what, we'll, what we'll see is the vice presidents of, of large corporations um, get, attaining, uh, putting food into to, to stores and restaurants will we'll just gravitate to these really large places where they can pick up the phone and get truckloads of, of whatever they want all at once that, that satisfies all the requirements. So, so it forces all of the dairies, uh, in our case, or, or pigs are much slower in our, in our country to, to come around, to, to, um, to start getting more of the good life attitude aspects of, of animal welfare into it. Um, so so it's, a comp it's complicated and this, uh, that, Love to talk about it all day, but um, yes, you're right. <laughs> I agree with you. David, any further comments David, from you in terms I mean, of physical I, versus? Uh... To link those two questions, actually, because I think the, yeah, on the education front, the point about uh, 
mental, physical and naturalness is, is a key aspect of the veterinary teaching uh, now and, and I think as more, more focusing on the mental aspects is, is a key outcome. Of, of, of those of that teaching uh, and to me the solution is of greater what uh, the industry needs to do is have a greater uh, uh, link with their, their customers because they think about animal welfare in terms of mental or natural state rather than the physical uh, state and actually I think the this debate might come again to the fore with the sentience conversation which I think is going to come from a policy point of view is going to come out again uh, we, you know, we had this uh, taking out the uh, um, uh, to do with the EU withdrawal bill, and uh, Michael Gove wants to bring back the sentience uh, debate. And positive welfare, for example, is quite clearly part of uh, the sentience conversation. So it's another opportunity to, to focus on the thing that matters to animals, which is their mental state. Okay. Just take a couple more comments on this first question. There's one there, and then one there, and then we'll move to the second question. So the lady over here has been waiting very patiently. Fiona Fell, I'd like to ask the speakers, what do they think will improve animal welfare in farmed animals in the medium and short term? Uh, will it be, um, we have a lot of knowledge already about animal welfare, will it be translating that research into cost-effective solutions? Uh, will it be regulation and standards? Will it be that, that social license? Uh, what's actually going to trigger and actually deliver uh, an outcome which is improved welfare? First, take that one first, David. Uh, I, I think the industry is trying as hard as it can on the, so we say, the soft levers of power of trying to get knowledge changing, all those sorts of things. And I think it should, and, and the strategies that uh, we talked about are, are good to a point. Uh, but the, the, the big changes, uh, are, are, I think, are. There's a big change there, that first question there. We have 25% of laying cows. You know, what, what is going to make those big sort of, big sort of changes? Uh, and uh, I think there is an opportunity in the UK agricultural policy to, to, to focus on the, on the good stuff and to try to encourage system level change. And the other big, big change, let's just be honest about it, is eating uh, less meat is part of the discussion. Uh, and we need, do need to eat less but better. Uh, so that's a big change. Thank you. Jim, any further comments on that? I agree with Dr. Main. Um, interestingly, and I won't be able to go home for this, but we need to eat less. We just need to do better with the animals we have and, and, and not consume as much. Um, I, I take, and, and just, just, just to throw this out as, as, a, as a thought, uh, I spent the, recently spent two years in a startup company. Uh, we travel across the United States providing welfare services, training and things and programs to dairies across the United States. And at the end, I had uh, given up talking about animal welfare, and I simply talked about animal <laughs> emotions. I was training people to understand when animals had emotions, when their emotions were good, when their animals, animal emotions were negative or in, in trouble, including their workers, and then, and, then, and then realizing that they would solve those problems on their own. Um, the, we can make all the rules and regulations. Coming from academia, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a clinician in academia and had been in private practice for a long time. Um, more research is rarely the answer. Uh, we just need to execute what we already know. We know what the animals want. We know what they need. We know why they get lame. We just can't make people change their behavior. So, so again, some of us uh, working in the U.S., when we do our meetings, we're not talking about welfare. We're talking about uh, this, the social aspects of how do we change people's behaviors because we need to motivate people to change things. So, so I agree. Thank you. A uh, question here, and then we'll move on to the next. Thank you. Um, Emily Coughlin from the RSPCA Farm Animals Department. Um, I just wanted to second a point that was actually made um, earlier about, you know, should vets be speaking up about these things? Um, yes, and, but also, you know, the ne necessity of these procedures, you know, we can't just stop them. But why have we got to a point where we can't just stop tail docking in pigs and the risks associated with that? Why do we have systems... Where these, where these procedures are necessary. And I think just from what Dr. Reynolds said about some of the states um, shutting down people videoing on farms and, and the rise in, in veganism and, and activism that we're seeing from these farm exposés, um, educating the public about these systems so they can make a more informed choice and the welfare outcomes assessment work that's happening on the 
UK farms and is increasing, I think is a really important way to show people what the different systems are and what their actual outcome effects are and then follow that through with production labelling so that consumers can make an informed choice um, and yes, they can eat less, they can choose a product that they know is better because it is followed up by a clear and transparent system, uh, not just a set of standards, but the actual welfare outcomes on farm that we are seeing from this system compared to this one. Okay, thank you. I see nods from the panel. Uh, so if we go to another question from Slido, uh, which I think is very pertinent to the original um, poll that we had. So if we remember the poll related to whether the UK has the highest welfare standards in livestock agriculture and the room was split pretty much down the middle. Um, we've got a question from James Russell um, saying that if 25% of the national dairy herd is lame at any time, up to 50% in some herds and, and sources referenced there, can we claim that animal welfare is good enough? So it'd be interested to hear from um, the panel and then maybe members of the audience who voted uh, in favour of the, the poll, maybe as to, in, in that situation, why we feel it's good enough. So maybe David first. I'm glad somebody's called that one out because, as I said at the start, I was expecting challenges and that's a, a really important challenge. Uh, and so, no, it's not good enough, but other countries have the issue. So if you're comparing countries, of course, you know, I, I think the industry action is, is to be applauded. But what I would, I just want to flag of them and us. Uh, we don't want to say, oh, farmers are at fault, they're not doing it, they've got lots of own cows, it's all their fault. Uh, no, we're a stakeholder here. The veterinary profession is part of, this, uh, part of this, this issue. And so are we as a veterinary profession doing as much as we can and should be about, say, the veterinary advice dealing with this complicated issue? Are we really sure that farmers are getting the best veterinary advice? L lameness in dairy cattle is a complex issue that... Uh, that that you can give the wrong advice for, but blatantly. So are we doing our bit? Is, so rather than just saying, oh yeah, farmers aren't doing enough. Come on, what are we doing? Are we doing enough? Professor okay. Reynolds? Well, that, that was a good challenge, Dave. Um, the, um, uh, I think clearly it, it, veterinarians on farms tend to acquiesce and, and not, uh, not lead to the future uh, enough with management practices and, and how to make change over time. Uh, I always tried to get my clients to, under, just to understand we would have uh, immediate and, and medium two to three year goals and, and long range five to 10 year goals and try to attain those. And, and we don't really push hard enough. Um, lameness is a very interesting issue because it hasn't really changed over time. Uh, mastitis might be another one. Uh, things can get better, but they tend to get better because animals are culled and not because we've improved. And so we simply get rid of the broken animals, and, and so we have to be careful. Again, the basic issues why dairy cows get lame, for instance, is, is, is pretty well understood. They're on concrete too long, they're wet too long. We're, we're feeding them the wrong ways so that we, we have the, the acidosis model. Uh, we make them thin so we're losing on the, on the fat pad model. We, we do different things. Getting change in, in that system is hard because of all the economic factors and the peer pressure factors from other people. I, I do want to point out uh, something that, that's uh, struck on, in this because it comes up with lameness and other things. I think overall for uh, countries in Europe and, and the UK and, and uh, North America, um, for cows on a dairy, for instance, if nothing goes wrong with you, you're probably living a pretty good life. I mean, it's probably not the greatest, but it's, it's, a good, it's okay. But if something goes wrong, it, it's pretty bad. <laughs> we're, our our tr veterinary treatments need to be improved. How we interact, we, we tend, at least in most places, not to, to use nursing care. So, so the first thing that happens with a lame animal of any other species is they get rest. But if you're a dairy cow, you've got to walk in and out of the parlor twice a day. And then you're limited in your pain management. So, so the rest of us would be laid up on the sofa watching television until we felt better. Or, or the dog, or, or the horse, or, or anything. But, but we have to have better ways of integrating a holistic approach, I think I heard that earlier, uh, to treating uh, broken animals on farms. We, we tend to, to just view it as pharmaceuticals at, at this point, and that's not uh, correct. Okay, thank you. Got a comment at the back there? Hi, uh, Dan Leonard. Um, just on this, this idea of applying more standards to UK farmers, I think it's really critical that we don't then export our problems and just import the produce from somewhere else. 
that's, that's not obs observing our standards. And I was going to ask also, from, from an American point of view, if we did have a trade agreement where the UK does set some high welfare standards, rather than having an open free trade agreement to all farms in the US, in theory you could have US farms that, that are inspected to meet the same standards. So it could be an option for US farmers that wish to you know, take advantage of the desire for the increased standards, which you know, we're, you referenced, um, to, uh, to actually open up trade for them as individual farms. Do you think that's a feasible uh, part of a trade agreement? <coughs> I, I, well, yes. Uh, <laughs> um, um, I, I think if, if you're asking advice from an American on economics, uh, on farm economics, is don't give up what you have. Uh, you, you'll, our system uh, has, has changed over the years from a supply management system to, to uh, a commodity-based system in which the profit margins are low, and when that happens, th then you then you have to consolidate and, and sell more products to make the living get the living you want, and you also have to expand markets. So what you have here, uh, from a welfare standpoint, is a high-quality market with a high value to to your products. Um, <laughs> I would not. Uh, I hope you don't let that slip. And. Um, America is looking desperately to, to export low-value products. <laughs> that's, that's how we make money. So, so keep your high-value uh, welfare things because that becomes something that we can attain. And, if, and we have to have our welfare programs stem from Europe. They come from there to us, here to us. Um, another thing that, that might be a, a useful uh, recommendation, perhaps, is, again, like I, rec like I said, in California, starting in 2022, we require pork to not be, have, have had any, spend any time in gestation stalls and, and eggs to come from uh, furnished housing or different kinds of housing. Uh, that capacity does not uh, exist in the, in the United States to supply the California market and will not uh, exist before 19, uh, 2022. So, so it needs to come from someplace else. Um, and, and hopefully we don't uh, water down our regulations just because there's no supply. Okay, thank you. John, do you want to comment at the front? Uh, I'd just like to say two amazing presentations today, and thank you very much. One thing that I really, there's so many things I could pick up on, but one thing I thought really struck home was Jim's comment, that it's the quality of the people on the unit which make all the difference. Forget about the size and the buildings, it's really the quality of the people. But just going back to the point on lameness, we've had some really interesting comments about education just now. And um, talking about lameness in dairy cows as an educator, that is absolutely key that that is welfare focused. So anyone who's left university having been taught even the basics of bovine lameness should be seeing that not really so much as a clinical problem, but a welfare problem. And I think that's really important that that should be in everyone's thinking when they leave university, bovine lameness, welfare problem, needs sorting. It's not good enough. It's just a comment I would make. That's a great example of where we can bring welfare to the centre of the clinical teaching. Thank you. Thank you. I think over there, next. Um, thank you, um, it's Kate Richards, RCDF Council. Thank you very much for your presentations, and specifically on housing, and we're talking about dairy cattle at the moment. I'm just wondering what you think the impact of the housing for dairy cattle, for both their well on welfare and also for their physical health, and um, the fact that for large portions of the year they're forced to uh, lie in cubicles in neat rows and often nose to nose as well. Uh, I, uh, again, I'm a little at a disadvantage here. Uh, the uh, 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 the housing is is uh, huge. That's why I always say it's a com welfare is a combination of housing and people, or people and housing. Um, uh, and and that, uh, the if for lameness, probably the, 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 the we'll use as a small example lameness in dairy cattle. Or uh, the highest predictor of health of feet in dairy cattle is how clean and dry they are. And then the next one is how much rest they get, and how much rest they get depends on their housing completely. And so, if the cubicles are older cubicles, mis missized, um, difficult to get up and down, and, and I haven't been on dairies, I will be on dairies. Uh, thank you, thanks to Matt Dobbs, uh, quite a bit in the next couple of weeks, but I haven't been for a while here. But in previous times, there've been a lot of 
um, mats, <laughs> and, and they just don't work for cows. So, so this is one of those things, uh, and you see them a lot in Europe, and, and where Europe, European companies uh, build a dairy in China or Turkey or anywhere else, you see mats, and, and they, you just end up with lame cows and broken cows. So, so the housing is huge, and, and recognizing the interactions of all of the factors of, of, of uh, lameness, uh, as an example, uh, is, is very powerful from a welfare standpoint, because it is a welfare standpoint a problem. And, and so to address it, you have to get to the cows resting. You have to get a soft, clean, comfortable place. There's lots of research on that. Um, we buy uh, organic milk in the United States, my wife and I, and, and it's because it, it, that's the only system in the U.S. that requires them to have some time on pasture. And, and that's important to, to lameness, just to get off of the, the hard surfaces. Um, so, so housing is, is uh, imperative, actually. And, and, and to, to say things that are um, where, where things are going wrong. In our system, we allow people to, uh, of course, to, to uh, be creative in, in a marketplace and find ways to solve problems. And producing food cheaply is one of the, is, a, is a problem. But we're seeing um, completely enclosed down, uh, buildings for for dairy cattle now, where they're inside without any windows or access to the outside or even seeing the outside for their entire lives now, where they're just cross ventilated because of the conditions in the upper Midwest, for instance, it's hot and humid in the summer and, and blizzard conditions in the winter. And so now they're just enclosed forever. And, and I'm, I, I'm not struggling with that. I don't like it at all, but we have no mechanism to, to do anything about that. I just want to make the point that, I mean, housing per se isn't necessarily, of course, a, a welfare insult. We're keeping cows in six months a year in any system. But the, the, the uh, larger economies of scale issue comes into play when uh, farmers put in new housing systems which really do cater for the size uh, and comfort of the cows. And my experience at the University of Bristol, when they did that, it had very significant health blameless benefits. Uh, but on the other hand, I do also want to flag the fact that cows do choose and would want to go out at different times. And so there's some nice work in Canada looked at how hard cows would work to, 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 do, to go out. And they do exhibit a preference for going out at certain times. It's difficult to predict, so the best solution is to have an open gate. So uh, behavioural choice is a, is, a, is a good thing, and so is the right design cubicle. I'd like to just interject one thing, that, that, that being a veterinary group, um, mainly. Uh, actually, the reason I got into animal welfare in the 1990s when it was starting to be discussed in the U.S. was because um, it hit me that the reason, ev the reason everything was wrong, anything went wrong on a dairy farm was my, my, my work, it was because we weren't taking care of the animals properly. The animals do what they're supposed to. The cows and the calves always do what they're supposed to. It's, it's us that does something. And so animal welfare is the, is the key to, to actual medicine. It's, it's, if the animal welfare is correct, then the animal physiology can do what it's supposed to. And they, they recover from minor illnesses and injuries really well, except when we don't take care of them. So, so it's, a, it's the platform that we should use for all of medicine. Okay, great. Thank you. Changing tack slightly, we'll go to um, the question highlighted in, in yellow on the slide there that you can all see. So, um, relating more to, to uh, the end of their lives, that non-stun meat is still allowed for religious reasons, yet it's not the best animal welfare. Um, could we apply a UK-wide ban for production but still allow import? I know this is a very uh, important topic in the UK and one that we discuss a lot. Um, so, I don't know, um, David, do you want to make any comments first or... I, I think the BVA have been leading on this, and so I'd really like to hear the, an update from BVA and their thinking around the trade rules. Sorry to throw it back. <laughs> That's, I think. <laughs> okay, I don't know. Um, the BVA president may want to, has, has the microphone, so, so I, <laughs> I suspect I have, we'll, yeah, we'll now comment. <laughs> I know I have the microphone, so I will comment. Um, I'll actually start off by just uh, reassuring David that. Uh, whenever I, I've spent three and a half years doing consultancy for the Department for International Trade and regularly use the hashtag animal welfare is great um, during my presentations. Um, it, it is certainly something that we have been looking at developing. Now, obviously, I was working within the agri-tech um, team rather than the, the food, food and drink team. Um, but certainly as part of the UK branding around UK agriculture, it's certainly with something we've looked very, very carefully at. Um, and I'll just um, very quickly, um, uh, 
try and read you a tweet which the Department for International Trade made the day before yesterday in response to NFU, in fact, um, which said, we will not compromise on our high food and animal welfare standards as, as part of any trade deals. Any future deal with the US must work uh, for UK consumers, farmers and companies. So um, that sort of piece across Whitehall um, between DEFRA, um, APHA and the Department for International Trade um, around animal health and welfare is actually um, a really important one and I think relationships which are developing. Um, specifically around non -stun, um, so I mean this, is, this has been an, an ongoing campaign for BVA um, over the last number of years um, and our top line hasn't changed. Our top line is that we would like to see a complete ban um, on non stun slaughter in the UK. However, um, on the basis that there is a derogation in place and um, you know, to allow uh, limited quantities of uh, non sun slaughter for specific religious communities and the spirit of the derogation is, uh, would suggest that that uh, should be for domestic purposes. Uh, we have then made a couple of sort of additional pragmatic calls in, 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 in the current um, state of play. So one of the things we've been working uh, with Michael Gove and David Rutley on um, is looking towards a call for a ban on export of non-stun slaughter from the UK. Um, so we know that at the minute, the, the figures that came out from the Food Standards Agency recently suggested that there were um, parts of the um, slaughter process in the UK where there were being you know, significant proportions uh, of, of uh, non-stun was being exported and we would like to see a ban um, on that. Um, and one of the things, uh, the themes that's come up on a number of occasions today has been um, around clearer labelling. Um, and um, certainly we would like to see, um, you know, clearer labelling around non-stun slaughter. Now, at the minute, part of what has driven our uh, Choose Assured campaign has been a proxy because all of the farm quality assurance schemes require animals to be pre-stunned before slaughter. Um, and on that basis, we've been using Choose Assured as a, as a proxy um, for that. We continue to work with the farm quality assurance schemes to look um, towards um, outcome-based well, um, welfare measurements on farm, um, and also then looking at um, pieces around um, lifetime assurance. Um, so increasing the scope um, of animal welfare within um, those schemes. Um, but certainly around um, non-stun, um, that's where we are at the minute. I recently took part in a round table, which was a very complete round table with all the stakeholders at the table, uh, which was hosted by Michael Gove and David Rutley. Um, there was nothing probably new in the discussions, but actually having the people all round the table at the same time um, gave an opportunity for a respectful um, conversation um, to be had around, um, around the key issues of non -stun. Okay, Thank you for that uh, comprehensive update. Simon. Has there any, anyone got any other comments or questions specifically on that issue? I think we've got one here. Catherine? Um, Catherine NFU again. I just basically wanted to back up some of what Simon has said. Um, it is really important, certainly amongst this audience, that we recognise and we say as often as we can, Red Tractor, all of the farm insurance schemes in the UK, it has to be stunned. And that's really important. One of the other things that certainly I think just be aware as well, it's a really important market for our sheep industry. So we need to be careful that we, you know, that we get the balance right here as well. Because ultimately as well, if you suddenly stop it, we'll damage the sheep industry, we'll put it underground and we'll just import the welfare issues elsewhere. And that's, that's not going to help anybody. One of the things that the NFU is, is calling for is a little bit more flexibility from our government that we actually start and we recognise and we look more at the um, recoverable stun science and we look at some of those kind of scientific parameters. So again, this would be something that I'm sure that came up in the round table that you talked about. I mean, we need to start and again, bring a bit of science into this debate. Okay, thank you. Any further comments on this topic? No, okay, well, I think mo moving on nicely, actually, the two, the two questions that are at the top now in terms of do our citizens say one thing when asked but do something different when they go to the shop and the fact that we've touched on the assurance schemes for meat sold in the UK but do the public know what these actually 
actually mean. Um, so I think that ties together very nicely with the fact that a number of times through the debate today we've heard about the consumer driving behaviour. I guess maybe a question for the panel as to what do they think we can be doing to, um, to help improve that and help support a consumer who say they want high welfare to actually um, deliver that. I think that first question is a really good essay question for <laughs> students because it's, of course, it's got a concept of citizens and consumers all sort of yeah. mixed and muddled in, in there. And I think it's quite useful to, to think of them separately because the, let's be clear about this. Citizens may, may not be eating meat products, and there are quite a few of them, uh, quite rightly have a view on how animals should be kept and sold in the UK. So. Uh, there's a set of policies around citizens, which I think that social licence aspect is really Im important. And consumers quite clearly have a role, and con consumers can help drive innovation and higher welfare products, and via retailers making brand editing decisions that they are only going to sell certain things is the other route of, or influence. But consumer behaviour is not going to sort animal welfare. Let's be clear about that. That's, that's not the solution to animal, animal welfare. Jim, do you have any comments on that? Is it a tool that we should use more or something that's... Um, I, I agree that the consumer attitudes will not solve animal welfare issues. <clears throat> At least where we are, uh, the consumer response to act animal advocate um, videos and pictures uh, drives retailers, and, and, that, and that gets us to a better place with welfare on farms. But to actually get to where the welfare needs needs to be for the animals, that that's um, I don't think consumers need to know that much about the topic. They just need to know that animals are taken care of well, and and they expect that. So, consumer surveys are always problematic, actually. Okay, thank you for a comment down here at the front. In my personal experience, there is a huge knowledge gap in terms of labeling and what that means. I. No, in the UK, one thing they do really great is mark their eggs with a number scheme that shows what system they come from. However, the information about what system that number corresponds to is not provided. I recently read an article in Belgium where they have applied barcodes to packaging for meats so that you can scan it with an app on your phone that actually gives you information for the system. And I think if something like that can be introduced, it can really help provide more knowledge. Thank you. Any further comments from the panel on that? Well, I th the, the comment about labelling, I, I, uh, I, I think having different types of labelling information is, is useful. Some people say, oh, it's too confusing. I think we shouldn't treat our consumers like idiots. You know, they, they can work out what a red tractor is and they can, uh, they can find out that information about caged, non-caged, what it, what, what, it, what it means. So provide, provide the information, and, but there are some, some gaps quite clearly at, at the moment. So... Uh, yes, we've got a system for lay, laying hens, and that's a mandatory by, 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 by European legislation. But we've only got an industry code for pigs for part of it. We haven't really got, the first question is very relevant here, we haven't really got a system for dairy cattle that, that, that is clear and transparent across, uh, across the board. Chickens, I see Littles are introducing their, their attempt at having a system uh, labelled to try and explain what the indoor bit is, ab is about. So, yes, we need to have... Uh, uh, better practice about describing particularly the system element. I think there's a good system around the assurance logos. I think that's good, but the system label needs some further work. Okay, thank you. Do we have a comment at the front now? Uh, thank you, James Russell. Um, I'm going to try and stick with the consumer bit here, but I apologise if this question rambles slightly, because um, I, I do have this concern that we have a role to fulfill in educating our consumers a little bit better. If I may give one very quick example, I remember being beaten to death at Toxta Town Council one night when I suggested we change our um, food sourcing policy uh, to include stun slaughter only. And I was challenged by a fellow councillor who said I was an animal because not only did I want to kill these things, I also wanted to stun them. <laughs> And that really pushed home to me just how poorly the whole system was understood. And I think at the moment we're in a situation where there is a rise in what one may call militant veganism, if I may. And we saw Project Dairy earlier in the year, which really put a lot of pressure and a lot of stress on a number of very good food producers in the country. 
and you may have seen the image doing the rounds in social media at the moment, allegedly of a, of a foal having its head lasered off. It's actually an image of a calf being disbudded. Um, but this is being picked up on as a foal having its head lasered off. Okay? We have a real problem of uh, lack of understanding amongst large sectors of our, of our community. And where I would like um, some guidance from, from the panel, really, is how can we as vets best um, challenge and change that perception without inflaming the situation any further and without, as you've quite rightly said, David, doing down the views of those people who choose not to engage in the uh, meat eating community at all. Okay, thank you. Any thoughts from the panel? That's a, uh, uh, an excellent question. Probably a, it's one <laughs> knew the, the answer to that. Then we. <laughs> One for, one for the, the audience, but I just want to also flag BVA has done some really good work about assurance labelling, etc. So that's the sort of thing that we need to do. And it's not necessarily persuading individual consumers, it's, it's, it's persuading retailers and food, food chains, food, restaurant groups. That those are the, a, ma a major point of influence. So before we move on, are there any other comments on specifically the labelling and consumer influence? Simon, did you have something else? Yeah, I just want to say a really quick word. Um, we'll bring James up to speed before he becomes JVP. No worries, you can. Um, the, uh, I ju just, um, most people in the room are probably aware, uh, obviously we produced an animal welfare um, policy and, uh, a number of years ago, and, and really that strategy has kind of underpinned a lot of our activity um, sort of more recently since then. So everything that we've done kind of around non-stun, uh, around labelling, uh, you know, around um, even brachycephalic breeds and, and dogs and all that kind of stuff, everything that we've been doing um, has been underpinned by that animal welfare strategy. I think the important thing that I just wanted to highlight is that we're now building a number of positions on top of that. So we're working with some of our specialist divisions to look towards um, creating specific uh, sort of policy pieces that we can then use to educate both um, the profession and uh, the general public. So we've got a position now on anaesthesia and analgesia associated with, uh, for use in calves, associated with um, routine husbandry procedures. Um, we're looking at, at things like um, tail docking and, and beak trimming and, um, or sorry, beak treatment is what we're apparently, what we're supposed to refer to it as now. Um, and, um, and using those to then underpin some of, of, of the other communications activities that we have then coming out from BVA. So just to kind of give you a quick, um, a quick feel for that as well. But we're also then taking that into Europe. So we're taking that to FEE. That has been really well taken up by FEE. And other um, European countries now are looking at creating an animal welfare strategy in a similar vein to our own. We're taking that to WVA um, and to IVOC and, and, and talking with other officers in other veterinary associations around the world. And they are actually using this um, as the basis for, for creating some of their own um, strategies in the same vein. Thank you. I think we had one other comment at the front here, maybe on the is it on the labelling um, it's consumers. Veganism. Just okay. <laughs> to I'm Caroline Allen from the RSPCA. Um, I wanted to pick up on the point about the consumers who are kind of choosing just to move out of buying these products. Um, you know, the rise in veganism, plant-based diets, meat substitutes, and really how the veterinary profession should engage in that. Um, obviously, we hear about the militant vegans, but there are a lot of vegans who aren't militant. I live in an area with really very high levels of veganism, I'd say, if you look at the restaurants, and they are actually clients of other vets, so they're going to vet practices. So I think we do need to think about that engagement um, and what that means for the profession more widely and how we can get beyond this sort of... There is a combative approach sometimes, and I think we just need to think a little bit more about that, so I appreciate your thoughts. Any thoughts from that from our two panel members? I, I, I think that's a very useful distinction, the militant versus not militant, because yeah, there, there, there is definitely an issue with activi uh, animal activists moving from experimental animals to, to the, the meat sector. So, you know, we can all rally around and say militant veganism and, and disruption to individual farmers, that's, that's, that's a problem. Uh, but non-militant veganism is not. You know, that's a more wider society uh, d debate. And uh, to me, the, the thing is about eating animals is special. 
it's a, it's, you might call it privilege, da, 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 da. It's, a, it's a high quality thing to, to do. It needs to be justified, it needs to be reared in the right way. And so we, 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 we want to flip it rather than being defensive. It's saying, well, it, it must be pretty good to be able to do that. Uh, and we need to eat less of it as, as well. Um, would be high welfare, less but high welfare. Yeah, and I think you made that comment earlier, I think, as well, Jim, that the sort of less but high welfare. Any other comments on the veganism? Um, um, certainly people can choose whatever they want to eat, and in today's world, uh, there's no reason to eat meat and still be healthy. Um, uh, a short thing on the, on the uh, labeling. We have no rules uh, on labeling in the U.S. on, on food products, so it's all marketing. There, there's actually no government decisions about it. So it becomes very confusing. I'm aware of the studies, the research uh, in Europe on how confusing it is for people with, with actual uh, defined labels. Um, people, people should just choose what they want to eat and be comfortable with that. I don't think we're seeing a militant veganism in the U.S. I think we saw that we have a People for Ethical Treatment of Animals, which we are our militant group at the moment for the past 20, 30 years. They've kind of toned down and become a, a regular mainstream sort of a political force. Um, we don't, we're not seeing the same problem. We, it doesn't mean we won't, <laughs> but people, I, I, I enjoy people with passion for their topic. If they're passionate about being vegans and about making change in animal welfare, uh, then, then I try to uh, uh, work with the parts that, they, that I can work with because in our system, that's how we motivate people to change, is people with passion, so. Okay, thank you. As we move towards, uh, sort of the end, towards the end of the debate and having the vote again, I think this is a really good question to think about. Uh, having the highest welfare standards and actually meeting them or exceeding them are two different things. Where does the panel sit with, are we actually meeting them right now? So again, David, do you want to have a first shot at well, that? Well, I think on the standards such a uh, what does that word mean in legislation compliance and all those terms i think we we are i mean i think we can be proud of uh, uh, of what our industry is doing in terms of retractor etc and uh, of what our government is doing uh, but of course that's not outcomes we uh, we have uh, we can have farms with lots of land cows which are completely compliant with the law so it's to me of course it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's about the outcome and stuff uh, and that's a work in progress that's we need to keep keep hassling about that, the, are we delivering the, the good enough welfare outcomes? Okay, thank you. Professor Reynolds? It's, uh, certainly, I think the UK has excellent um, regulations and standards, that's for sure. Um, probably uh, there are some Scandinavian countries that, that probably exceed those, but if you're looking at it um, from a bit far away, you'll, you'll recognize that the more homogeneous uh, a region or, or a, a system is, the more standardized things can be. And then you get to uh, uh, see even within the European Union, you have a range from, from um, as, as everybody here knows, Spain to, to uh, Scandinavia. And in, in the US or Canada, we just have lots of different geographies and environmental conditions and places that uh, require different uh, ways of approaching uh, welfare and, and housing and management. And so the systems will, <clears throat> so comparing the welfare standards from the UK, which are excellent, to other places is uh, difficult because we need flexibility in, in larger regions. We, have, we go from deserts to, to blizzards and, and everything in between. So, so it's hard to have standards uh, that will meet yours in the short term, but I think we'll all come together uh, in, like I think I said, 20, 10 to 20 years uh, as, as meat becomes more of a valued commodity and there are alternatives for people for, for protein sources. So, so you have the good you have good ones. I'm uh, after three weeks I'll come back and, and see how well they've been um, enforced. <laughs> Any comments from the audience on that or questions to follow up on that at all? Yes, we've got one in the middle here. Yep. Uh, I'll come clean fairly early on. Uh, David Channels, I'm a general practitioner all my life, um, and I've done a lot of pig work and dabbled a bit in poultry. <laughs> um, maybe I'm going to take the opportunity to half summarise this, but 
I've been sitting here listening to the presentations, which were excellent and incredibly well balanced. <clears throat> and early on, it was asked, you know, what's the most important thing we can do, or what's the most important factor? And I whispered under my breath, profit. <clears throat> and that took me forward because you've now said something, David, which is eating meat or using animals is a privilege. And we should respect that. And the biggest problem we have, I think, is food is too cheap. Things that are cheap have no value. So we waste more. And it's utterly scandalous that maybe 30% of the animals that are killed for our benefit get chucked into a black plastic bag and go into landfill or digesters. So if we could make people value animal products more and pay more for them, because if they value them, they will pay more for them. And the human will pay more, because you can get round England in a Ford Fiesta, but people buy BMWs and Jaguars. So they will spend money where they think they're getting something of value. And if we add value to farming, the one thing, coming from my other admission, from a farming family and a part-time fam farmer, farmers don't like paying tax. So if they make profit, they will invest. And then the veterinary profession, rather than fighting this defensive, well, we have to tail dock because we have to produce pigs at this price. We have to keep cows on concrete because we've got to produce milk at this price. And Jim, you said that. In the States, it's a commodity. And the only way you make profits is to make more. And the only way you make more is to make them work harder. So if we could change that attitude, then the farmers will deliver. Because once they're paid more, people can say, well, you're earning more, you're making more money, so you can spend more on your buildings, you can spend more on your welfare, and you can spend more on your staff and on your training. So I think the answer, right at the bottom, you ask the question, because all the questions have now linked together, yeah. about the consumer. If the consumer can value animal products more, the animals will benefit. So I don't know if that's a question or a comment or just a piece of arrogance on my part. <laughs> <laughs> maybe the panellists would like to comment. Right, and I think actually we're moving towards, I have my red light now, so um, on that very uh, eloquent note, um, if I could give both of our panellists just one minute to sum up their thoughts uh, following, following the debate we've heard before we uh, ask you all again to see, and we'll see if anybody's minds have been changed. So rem reminding ourselves that the, the original proposal was the UK has the highest welfare standards in livestock agriculture. Um, David, you were proposing that, so with a minute, could you want to summarise um, your thoughts having listened to the debate? We do have high standards. We could go further. I, David's point about it, it's going to cost more and it's, and it's, it's a higher value, we absolutely do. I want to flag one other debate which we haven't talked about, and that's the issue of food poverty. Uh, because uh, a, a really interesting report, I think it's called Broken Plate, which looked at the, the lowest 10% of, 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 of income households, they pay 74% of their income on food, whereas the overall average is less than 10 or something. So th that is a problem, and quite clearly a problem for, for, for this issue, but there are other solutions for that, and let's not solve, the, deal with the 90% by one issue with the, with the 10%. So that is another important policy question we have to address. Okay, thank you. And um, Professor Reynolds, do you want to summarize up the opposing the motion. And again, thank you for uh, inviting us here to do this. I'm, I'm impressed with the group and, and the debate. Um, <clears throat> there's no question that the UK, that you have all put together exceptionally good welfare standards and regulations. Uh, the point that I'd like to leave is that regulations aren't, aren't actually um, the end all and the be all. It's really what, as David what Miller says in, from New Zealand, what the lives of the animals have. And, and that's how compassionate people are. So, so the schemes need to take into account the lives of the animals uh, rather than uh, specific protocols. Okay, thank you. And on that note, could I ask you all to once again go um, onto the Slido site and again into the poll se section uh, and again vote on the same motion and we'll see if the last uh, hour, couple of hours of th thinking about this has changed people's minds. So I'll give you all just a minute to do that. Oh. <laughs> Two percent shift. <laughs>
<laughs> what, the, what we don't know is whether everyone shifted, but <laughs> equally. <laughs> so um, on that note, um, thank you very much um, to both of our panel speakers, but also to all of you who've contributed um, with the, your thinking. Um, it's certainly a very broad, very broad ranging topic. We've covered a lot of issues, not just related to animal welfare, but to society more generally. But um, if you could, um, before we go to lunch, join our hands together in thanking both of our speakers and enjoy your lunch. Thank you.